In 2002, the people of East Timor won their hard-earned independence. For centuries, they had been under the colonial rule of Portugal. And after they left, they were invaded by Indonesia. But the East Timorese got a chance to vote at the turn of the century. And a staggering 78% casted their ballot in favor of independence. This was reason to celebrate. The world saw the birth of the first new nation of the millennium. But decades of suppression had left the country dirt poor. East Timor was the poorest country in Asia. Their annual GDP per capita was just under $500. And their average life expectancy was as low as 57 years. Their newly elected leaders rested the massive task of somehow making the nation prosper. But there was hope. East Timor had a lot of oil. Off their coast in the Timor Sea, massive reserves of oil and natural gas were still untapped. And they were worth tens of billions of dollars. Per person, the value of that oil is like that of Norway. But the East Timorese don't drive Teslas just yet. There was a problem. For East Timor to have the right to drill, they need those fields to lay within their maritime borders. And they think that it does. But that claim is contested by Australia. Australia and East Timor have had disagreements over the exact locations of their maritime borders ever since gas and oil were found. This had stalled the extraction. And for East Timor, their economic future was at stake. This is the Timor Sea maritime border dispute with hindsight. Australia's relationship with Timor is complicated. In World War II, they fought alongside the Timorese against Japan. At that time, the island was already politically divided, with the Dutch administering the West and the Portuguese the East. But when Japan made its advances in the region, the Dutch and the Portuguese joined in defense, and Australia lent a helping hand. The islands eventually befell to Japan. They surrendered at the end of World War II, and the Portuguese resumed its colonial rule. But in 1975, a nationalist movement was gaining momentum and they declared independence. But its movement's leader had leftist socialist ideals and this was perceived by Indonesia as a threat. The first oil fields were discovered around that same time. The Australian leadership was keen on getting its fair share, but felt uncertain about negotiating with an independent East Timor. Australia and the US secretly affirmed their support if Indonesia would do something about it. A week later, they invaded the island. Australia became the first Western country in the world to recognize Indonesia's sovereignty. And in the decades that followed, Indonesia kept a tight grip on the people. Their rule was brutal. Tens to hundreds of thousands of people died in a widespread famine and fighting, as much as a quarter of the whole population. When Australia learned about some of the atrocities that were committed by Indonesia, they helped downplay these events and they kept it under the table. In a way, Australia enabled these atrocities, all in the name of maintaining good diplomatic relations with Indonesia. The irony is that East Timor eventually gained independence and that Australia played a crucial part in this. They led a multinational peacekeeping mission for the first time in history and they contributed most soldiers. Australia's support was crucial and eventually led to East Timor gaining its independence. To this day, this is a matter of pride to many Australians and rightly so. As I said, the relationship between East Timor and Australia is complicated and it has long been overshadowed by this border dispute. In a nutshell, this is where the biggest oil and natural gas reserves are confirmed in the Timor Sea. The center of attention is the Greater Sunrise Oil Field, which is still untapped 
and is worth about $40 billion. And here's the dispute. Whether Australia or East Timor has the right to drill these fields depends on where the maritime borders are drawn. Under UN law, each country is entitled to a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. But this causes some overlap. Australia argues that the borders should be drawn here, tossing the natural prolongation principle. This principle dictates that the maritime borders should, as far as possible, be drawn where the natural extension of its landmass ends. And this puts some of the biggest oil fields conveniently within Australia's exclusive economic zone. But East Timor raises a counter-argument and says that the border should instead be drawn here, tossing the median line principle. This principle dictates that the maritime border should conform to a median line between the two land masses. And this puts much of the oil and the gas within the East Timorese borders. The two countries have agreed on some borders. In the 70s and 80s, they agreed on this being the seabed boundary, this being the boundary for commercial fisheries, and this was the agreed zone of cooperation. This zone was further divided into three areas, that of Indonesia, that of Australia, and the area where revenues are shared equally. But East Timorese officials now argue that Australia was getting the better end of that deal. And not unimportantly, the deal was made with the Indonesian government. When East Timor gained independence, that changed everything. In the years leading to the independence, Australia took measures to maintain its authority in the Timor Sea. In March 2002, Australia withdrew its recognition of several international bodies to solve maritime disputes. They were basically saying, whatever they say, we don't acknowledge. So East Timor was left to its own devices. Then they gained independence. A year later, East Timor and Australia reached their first agreement. They agreed on a new composition of the Timor Gap. Instead of dividing it into three zones, it was now one zone with East Timor getting 90% of the revenue and Australia 10. But this agreement excluded some of the largest reserves. East Timor could now exploit the Bayou Undan field and as they were in desperate need of cash, this was a great development. But the Australian government stalled signing the agreement until East Timor would sign another one regarding the much larger Greater Sunrise Field. Knowing that the East Timorese were desperate, they could negotiate getting an 82% share of that field, despite it being twice as close to East Timor. And here's the crutch. It's very likely that East Timor would get the full rights to the large Greater Sunrise Field if Australia and East Timor would settle their maritime borders under international law. Australia knows this, and they have the leverage to postpone such an agreement. Protests in East Timor are ramping up. But the public pressure was mounting. Both in Australia and East Timor, people began protesting these accords. And partly therefore, in 2006, they signed a new agreement. Australia and East Timor agreed to share the revenue of the Greater Sunrise 50-50, under the condition that they would not draw its maritime borders for another 50 years. Australia gets the oil, and East Timor gets a payday sooner rather than later. And this started preparations for drilling, which came with a whole new set of different challenges. But this time, they were making progress towards exploiting the oil and enriching both countries. But all of that came to a screeching halt in 2012. A former Australian spy confessed that the Australian government had bugged the cabinet room of East Timor. They were spying on them as they were negotiating the terms for the extraction. And this left the East Timorese feeling horribly betrayed 
they felt that Australia had an unfair advantage and they took the case to the International Court in The Hague. What East Timor wanted was to nullify their previous agreement. They felt it was finally time to draw their maritime borders once and for all. But the drama became more dramatic. Days before the court date in The Hague, the Australian Secret Service raided the offices of the East Timorese lawyers. They seized documents and took the passport of the infamous whistleblower. This created again public outrage in both East Timor and Australia. See, the UN has historically favored the median line argument and if they would settle the dispute, it is very likely that East Timor would get all greater sunrise revenues. And this is something that Australia was trying to prevent. Court battles followed for the next several years, until in 2016, judges ruled that East Timor could nullify the agreement and both countries can pursue drawing its borders. In 2019, they agreed on what those borders would look like. It works as follows. The borders are close to the median line, but run through the greater sunrise field. But East Timor has a significantly higher share of the revenue. They are entitled to 80% if they allow Australia to process the oil, or 70% if they run it through their own territory. But not only the Australian and the East Timorese government agree to this, but also the corporate partners. East Timor gets a permanent maritime border as it had wanted for so long and is now one step closer to extracting those resources. While in Australia, the deal is largely interpreted as the end of the dispute. Check out my video about Indonesia's road to independence next. They were ruled for centuries by the Dutch. Curious how they shook them off? Click on the video on the left and I'll see you there.